Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is a video starting biopsychology. Um, so we're going to be looking at the nervous systems today uh, and how they break down. Um, I will do a brief introduction to biopsychology because it is quite a unique uh, study uh, uh, topic in some ways. Uh, and this is what we are going to be looking at, right? So the main thing about uh, biopsychology is your A01 has to be really good for biopsychology, much more than, probably more so than any other topic. Um, that's because there's not as many areas that you may be evaluating and certainly not applying. So your knowledge of this uh, topic has to be really, really good. It has to be quite technical. Those who don't like science are probably not going to thrive in this topic. Those who do probably will. There's a lot of terms coming your way and you can see quite a lot of them. But today what I want to focus on is the the or sorry are the divisions of the nervous system, the central and peripheral nervous systems, and the peripheral then breaks down into the somatic and the autonomic nervous systems. So that is pretty much what the focus will be of this video. It shouldn't take too long, and there's no evaluations. Why? Because how the hell can you evaluate the nervous system? It's really quick, right? You you can't really or particularly evaluate the nervous system. Um, so biopsychology appears in paper two. Um, this is the, arguably the first real topic of paper two that you're going to look at. Uh, there's not so many pieces of research apart from in the fourth or fourth or fifth bullet point, um, the fourth bullet point. So there's not so many pieces of research, but you, as I say, you are going to need good A01. When we're talking about biopsychology in general, um, we're really talking about uh, biological psychology. The concept that anything psychological in you must have a biological cause or a, a traceable um, kind of observable thing. So, for example, if you're happy then there must be something biological pushing that, right? If you are angry, there must be something biological and you should be able to observe this. So this is a central facet of biopsychology is that all behavior can be traced back to observable and biological components, uh, which I'm sure we'll go into in a bit more detail. So uh, nervous system, why do we look at the nervous system? It seems very bio, bio, you know, it should be in biology. And I, I actually think it is in biology, but um, uh, it, it is a part, you know, it is a part of your psychological makeup um, is your, I'm sorry, I'm just going through some things here. So this is something I often get my students to think about is how many systems of the body there are. Now, the jury is out on this, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, but I've already clicked on this. And I have here Wikipedia, so not exactly a scientific fact, but I've got 11 systems of the body. We've got the cardiovascular, so hearts, arteries, veins, for example. We've got the digestive system, We've got the endocrine system, which we're going to be looking at in a week or so's time. The endocrine system is to do with hormones, and you can quite clearly see the link here between that system and behavior. Your behavior is caused very strongly, by the way, by uh, hormones. Um, so, so on and so forth. You've got the exocrine system as opposed to the endocrine system. Exocrine is getting things out of you. So skin, hairs, nails, sweat, exocrine glands, for example. The immune system, muscular. And then seventh, we've got the nervous system. So we're just going to read what the nervous system does here. It collects and processes information from your senses via nerves in the brain and tells the muscles to contract to cause physical action. So that is the role of of the nervous system so let's start getting to, let's properly get into this right so nervous system can be broken down into central and peripheral and you might you might want to make a note of that in the boxes in your workbook now one just before you make the mistake that a lot of students make the peripheral is the nervous system that breaks down a bit more fully. So if you're looking to fill in your workbooks, uh, the boxes in your workbook, you've got nervous system, you've got your central nervous system, which is basically your brain and your spinal cord, right? We'll go for that in a second. Your peripheral nervous system 
is every, peripheral means outside of. So the peripheral nervous system is any, anything that comes outside of your central nervous system. So basically anything that then comes out of the spine, and down the legs, maybe down the arms, anything that comes out of that central nervous system is part of your peripheral nervous system. So let's start with the central nervous system. The whole point of it is to ensure life is maintained. It's a central communication hub. So anything and everything you do essentially starts in the central nervous system, mostly starts in the central nervous system. Reflexes are, are the only thing that doesn't. Um, there's a fluid in your central nervous system. Um, useful to know this, I guess, called the cerebral spinal fluid. If that gets infected, that is essentially what meningitis is, right? So, um, and in this c cerebral spinal fluid, that's where a lot of the messages are actually carried down. Your peripheral nervous system is anything that comes out of your central nervous system and transmits messages to and from um, your senses, basically, and your and your effectors, known as your muscles. So, that might make it a little bit clearer. You've got your brain and your spinal cord going down here, central nervous system. Then anything that comes out of your spine is essentially um, a peripheral to the central nervous system. Uh, and you've got a lot of nerves that come out. Um, anyone who has trapped a nerve knows how frigging painful it can be. Um, sometimes people get like a trapped nerve in their eye and it kind of flickers. That's quite a common one. But I once trapped this particular nerve here, the median nerve. And it shitting hurt. I did it picking up a loaf of bread at a weird angle. My arm was literally like behind me. And the cashier, who shall remain nameless because I don't know her name. But the cashier didn't throw the bread down the her till that well. And I had to like bend my arm back to pick it. And as I picked it up, I felt something go in my arm. Uh, and then I went off to play golf, which turns out was the worst thing you could have done. And um, it was agony. It was agony for weeks. So you can trap some of your peripheral nerves. Your uh, sciatic nerve, a lot of you are going to trap this quite a lot or that's going to flare up quite a lot. I flared up my sciatic nerve. Um, doing something recently. What was I doing? But again, it bloody hurt. You don't need to know those names. Um, don't need to know those names. Just do me a favor. Don't trap your nerves. No, there you go. You're welcome. So let's start having a look at this in a bit more detail, right? So your central nervous system is uh, your your brain and your spinal cord. It's linked to vital functioning, um, so on and so forth. And the whole point about the central nervous system is is to maintain life, but is to is to send messages via the central nervous system and out to the peripheral nervous system. So right now, for example, right now uh, I've got my um, my stylus in my hand. Uh, the peripheral nerves in my fingers, and my fingers are packed with nerves, by the way, um, are sending this message back up my arm, through my shoulder, into my spine, and then back up into my brain, which is going to interpret it. So there's a lot of communication between the central and the peripheral nervous systems. The peripheral nervous system is involved in, um, the, re in the reflex, and I'll have more on that in a second. Um, and that is your, on the left hand side, that is your, that's the entirety of your central nervous system. Uh, that is a real brain and spine, by the way, but that is a brain connected to the spine, which is not connected to anything there actually, but uh, damage to this, damage to the spine will mean messages cannot pass down into the peripheral nervous system. The higher up the spine you have this damage, the more of your body is essentially going to be paralyzed. I knew somebody who was a stuntman uh, who uh, basically had to do a flip and for reasons I'm not going to go into, um, that flip went wrong. He landed on his neck and he's, he's about 10 years on, he's, he's still um, in a wheelchair uh, because basically the messages from his brain could not get past the damage and therefore everything here uh, wasn't receiving any messages, and so his muscles just no longer move. Uh, pretty horrible story. But um, <clears throat> yes, peripheral nervous system is split into two. So 
I'm going to go into this in as much detail as I can, but the peripheral nervous system is split into the somatic and the autonomic nervous system. So I'm just going to put me up here to block this out. We're going to start with the autonomic nervous system, right? Which, if you were paying attention earlier, actually splits down into two more again as well. The autonomic nervous system is responsible for anything automatic that we don't consciously do. So it's an involuntary nervous system. You don't really have control over this. So it uh, regulates the functions of your heart, your intestines, your, your stomach, your lungs, for example. Yes, you can control your breathing. But generally now, until I said this, you weren't paying attention to your breathing. And now you may be paying attention to your breathing. But all of this is involuntary. Why? Because that allows us to be able to concentrate on voluntary actions like moving and talking. But also, don't take this the wrong way, but if I put you in charge of your own breathing, I don't think you would last for much longer of the day. If you had to remind you, <gasps> okay, <gasps> I don't think you would actually do it. So in a way, we're, we have involuntary functions because we, we can't be trusted. Um, so part of the peripheral nervous system uh, and it also controls some of the muscles within the body. These are involuntary muscles, like I say, like the heart, like um, the contractions of your, not uterus, um, like your, um, your intestines to push the food through. Uh, and also your uterus. Um, <clears throat> So it regulates involuntary uh, responses. So we don't notice blood vessel changes or heartbeats. Um, eyes, I was going to poke myself in the eye then. Um, pupils responding to, you know, going into light. Um, somatic nervous system is essentially anything that is voluntary. I've made myself smaller. So part of, part of the peripheral nervous system connects the, uh, so you, uh, basically moving, moving and talking. Uh, skilled movements this uses somatic uh, nerves so the somatic nervous system does not break down any further right that is amazing isn't it clearly this is autonomic clearly this is autonomic um there's a couple of other ones there as well um but where is this nervous system top of the brain stem Right. So your hypothalamus is responsible for homeostasis. You may have learned this in GCSE biology. Uh, hypothalamus is responsible for um, the, the constant, uh, maintaining a constant internal temperature and you do not have any control over this. So if you're having a fever uh, when your body is trying to heat itself up to kill off the virus, uh, you consciously haven't said, well, crank up to 107, please. Um, it, that's your body involuntarily doing this part of the autonomic nervous system um <clears throat> now as i said autonomic breaks down a bit further and this is when we're going to kind of talk about fight or flight a little bit um the two ways it breaks down is your as it says at the top parasympathetic and your sympathetic before we look at this right now i would imagine all of you are in a calm state right you're not fighting off any tigers you know maybe a little bit stressed but you're generally in a calm state so most of you are going to be in a parasympathetic state however if a threat comes or you get stressed or worked up or physiologically aroused your body is going to enter into a sympathetic state where you burn off, and write this down, you burn off uh, energy quicker, you're in a heightened state of arousal, and therefore have an increased chance of survival. So on the left, on the right hand side is uh, on the uh, right, just here, are parts of your body, what your what parts of your body do in a parasympathetic state. So right now, your heart rate is probably quite slow. Right? I'm, in, I'm in a sympathetic state, and my heart rate at the moment is a nice 58 beats per minute. I'm calm, for example. My lungs, uh, my, my bronchi are constricted, so uh, I, I don't have, you know, I, I basically don't have as much lung capacity at the moment than if I was stressed. Uh, what other things? My bladder is uh, is contracted, 
So um, I'm not stressed. So my, my bladder is not trying to squeeze all the urine out to try dump the weight. Uh, and at the moment, my saliva is stimulated uh, partly because I can smell the, the chili that uh, Candy is currently making. Now, if something were to, I don't know, let's see, uh, a car were to crash into, uh, a car were to crash into that window right there, for example, or I'm um, driving in the car and I, I have a crash, I crash into an old lady or something who, who double stamps at a green light. Um, that happened to me. Um, my body is going to transition into a sympathetic nervous state where I'm going to burn off energy a lot quicker because my body is using uh, resources a lot quicker. My eyes are going to dilate, for example, let as much light in so I can see this old woman threat. My uh, saliva is going to stop because if I've just crashed into an old lady, I hardly need to be digesting the Weetabix I ate half an hour before leaving. My heart is going to accelerate, get oxygen around the body. My uh, my digestion is going to stop. See Weetabix comment. Um, my bladder is going to release or possibly may release because I may see this old woman as a threat, which she is, by the way, on the road, she is a threat to everybody. Um, and I may want to get away from her. And if I want to do that, I want to lose weight. And if I want to lose weight, I want to piss myself. So... That didn't happen, by the way. So you need to understand that actually these work uh, antagonistically to each other. When one system is activated, you cannot activate the other one. So, for example, if uh, my if my eye enters into a sympathetic state, it dilates. Well, I can't be dilating and constricting at the same time, right? I can't const I can't contract my bladder and release my bladder at the same time. So these work antagonistically to one another. Um, <clears throat> so only one can be working at the same time. And that, to be honest, is, is it really. Um, you, you're not likely going to get a difficult question on this. So as we can see here, the sympathetic nervous system is A, B, C, or D. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to answer that. Which one of the following responses results from the actions of the sympathetic nervous system? Which one of these three get you going? Which one of these do you think uses more energy? Decreased pupil size, increased digestion, increased heart rate, increased salivation. It clearly is C here, increased heart rate. So that is pretty much it. That is the basics of it. There are a couple more bits here. So definitely make sure you're looking at the um, Google Slides, but um, Google Slides, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, the site um, and any, uh, any other resources you have. But going back, the divisions of the nervous system, you need to know what the central nervous system is, what the peripheral nervous system is, what the somatic and the autonomic is. And hopefully we have answered those questions. So as always, hope this is useful.